All right, hey, well, Metro, we are in the middle of a series titled For You, Truth You Need to Follow. And the whole premise behind this series is very simply this. We wanna look at what are the relevant topics, the things that we as young adults are living through. What does God have to say about those things in our life? In the video, it kind of cued some of this up for you. Things like managing stress, which you talked about last week, or uh, what does it look like to find fulfillment in life or to seek significance? God, what do you have to say about these things? What truth? Could you offer to us as we navigate a world in which these are the questions we're asking? And listen, just I'll be honest with you from the, get, uh, from the get-go tonight, from the drop. The topic that I want to talk to you about tonight, it's personal for me. Like this is something that of any of the lessons God has been teaching me over the course of the last year, year and a half, this is the one that I think he's like, Kylan, you have got to get this across your mind. And it's simply this. It's the value of doing hard things, the value of doing hard things. Like this is a topic all of us can relate to. Like every one of us, we're gonna do hard things in life. Every one of us will move through times where we have to make difficult decisions or have difficult conversations. The question is not, are you going to have to do hard things? The question is how, how do we do hard things? Like how do we ultimately move through life in a way where we engage difficult situations with the kind of grace that God, he would prescribe, be true of us. And so to tell you how we do hard things, we're gonna be in the book of 2 Timothy. So if you have a Bible, you can grab it, 2 Timothy chapter two, uh, and we're just gonna take it from the very beginning. While you're turning there, let me just tell you this, a little background. Uh, This is a letter from Paul to his disciple, Timothy. Timothy was one of two disciples for Paul. He had Timothy and he had Titus. Timothy was his first disciple. And what we learn is that Timothy, he's been commissioned by Paul to lead the church at Ephesus, which is a huge church in a very secularized world. Like this was a church snack dab in the middle of the Mediterranean world. It was a part of a metropolis type environment. And what we know about the church at Ephesus is it was the headquarters, like it was HQ for the Christian movement to the Mediterranean. And so Timothy, he's the guy, he's the one calling the shots. He's the one running the place. He has a big job. And like anybody that has a big job, he's got really big challenges. And so Paul's writing to him. He's saying, hey, I know the challenges you're facing. Like the church at Ephesus, a couple of things that had crept in. There was some ungodliness. There was some bad theology. And so Paul's writing to him. And he's saying, hey, it's your job to confront these things, to do some hard things. And yet, Timothy, he is anything but an Enneagram 8. Like he doesn't run to the fight. He doesn't thrive in the face of conflict. What we know is that he's described as timid. He's fearful. Like Timothy, he's eaten up with some insecurity about the places that he grew up in, the family that he comes from. And yet Paul, he's telling him, hey, you have to be strong and you have to do your job. And it says so in 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll start in verse 1 and we'll just read it together. It says this, you then my child, they were close, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strengthened, how? By the undeserved kindness of Jesus Christ to you. That's where your strength comes from. So be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So what's he saying there? He's saying, hey, be strong and now take what I've given to you and entrust it to other people. Do your job, like step out, be strong, do the task at hand. He summarizes it it by saying in verse 3, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So it's interesting. That word, share in suffering, I say that word because it is one word for that entire phrase in the Greek. But when you take that word, which means to share in suffering, and you break it down, the root at the heart of suffering is just simply this idea that you're meant to endure hardship. So what he's saying is, hey, be strong and do what's hard. That's what Paul is saying to him. And that's the main idea of the night. The main idea of the night is that strong men and women, they do hard things. They do hard things. How do they do it? How do we do it? Like that's the question we wanna answer. And Paul's gonna tell us as we work through this chapter, he's gonna show us specifically three metaphors that unpack for us the way in which we're meant to do hard things in life. And so we're going to pick it right back up in verse three. It says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So there's metaphor number one, a soldier. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. 
since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So how do we do hard things? Well, the first thing that Paul tells us is we focus on what matters and we forget what doesn't. We focus on what matters and we forget what doesn't. So I remember my freshman year at college, it was a really special time in my walk with the Lord. You see, I had grown up in the church, uh, probably like some of you, and, and though I had grown up in the church, I just kind of knew things about God. Like, I didn't really walk with them. I didn't have a personal relationship. And yet, when I got to Texas A&M, in year number one, I learned, like, man, God, he doesn't just want me to know about him. He doesn't just want to save me. No, he wants me to walk with him. He's inviting me into relationship. And so, my first year at A&M, I learned what it looks like to walk with God. And as I go, I learned, like, man, he's amazing. I, I can't read my Bible enough. I can't go and walk and pray to him enough. I can't learn enough. I'm sitting at coffee shops for hours because that's what Christians do. They try to absorb as much from other people as they can about who God is. I was doing all of these things. And yet, as I was walking with God, what I learned is like, man, there are some things in my life, some areas in my life that have really gone untouched by God. Like, there are some things that Man, I just have never known that I'm supposed to surrender those to Jesus, and yet he's exposing, like, hey, I want that, and I want that, and I want that. And so the main thing, my freshman year of college, that God was like, hey, I, I love you. I need you to give me that. It was lust. It was lust. I, I, was, I was looking at pornography. I was obsessed with girls. I really wanted their attention. I wanted the affirmation of, like, hey, I love what, you know, hey, I love my boys, but listen, if she thinks I'm awesome, then that means so much more. And so I was invested in the opposite sex to a really unhealthy degree. And so I remember that Jesus was asking me to give that to him. And so not really having any solutions, I just decided, you know what? I'm supposed to take drastic measures to get drastic results. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk around campus, and instead of looking at everything around me, I'm just going to bounce this. And so I just walk. This was me, man. Like, I would walk around my freshman year, and I would bounce this tennis ball. Because so long as my eyes were on this tennis ball, I couldn't see anything else. And I'm not, I don't have great hand-eye coordination. And so I would lose the ball at times, and yet it would send me scurrying after it. But listen, it was better for me to focus on this than it was for me to focus on the myriad of distractions that were unhelpful, unhealthy for me across campus. You see, as I focused on what mattered, I forgot what didn't. Now, did this align with my desires? No. Lust is way more fun than bouncing a tennis ball. 100%. I didn't forego the things that I, or I, I didn't align with the things that I wanted. My behavior didn't correspond with my desire, and yet I was willing to forgo what I wanted in light of what I needed. You see, the decisions that I made as I walked across campus, they were not dictated by my cravings in life. They were dictated by my calling in Christ. Like, I had greater purpose and I knew it because Philippians 3, 12 through 14, Paul, again, he says this, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, don't miss this, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Listen, if we want to do hard things in life, then the first thing we have to do is we have to get our eyes on Jesus. That's the first thing you have to do. Why? Because if you get your eyes on Jesus, your feet will follow after Jesus. I remember as a boy, my dad, he was teaching me how to drive a boat. And what he told me is, when I got into the captain's seat, he was like, hey, if you want to drive a straight line, you don't look at the nose of the boat. Instead, what you do is you pick a spot on the horizon and you drive towards it. It's the same thing that happens whenever I cut my grass. I love straight lines in my yard. I don't want no crooked lines, and so what do I do? I don't look at the front of my lawnmower. No, I pick a spot out in front of the yard because I know my feet will follow wherever my eyes are directed. Like my eyes, they tell my feet where to go. This is what Paul's getting at. Like he says in verse 4 that a soldier doesn't get entangled in civilian affairs, but does what? aims to please the one that's enlisted him into service. 
This is an interesting idea. So that word entangled, uh, if you actually, and you go and you look at the original language, you look at the Greek, it's the word uh, implico, the same word we get for implication. And it means this, so this is a mouthful, but just follow me, to be involuntarily interlaced to the point of immobility. Let me unpack it. To be involuntarily, okay, I don't want this. I'm not volunteering for this. To be involuntarily interlaced, to be tied up to the point where you can't move. You're immobile. It's the same idea. They would use this word to depict the idea of a sheep being caught in a thicket of thorns. Like a sheep in their wool getting stuck in a thicket that they can't get out of on their own. They, they ultimately were stuck against their will. That's what this means. And here's what's interesting. Like if this idea, it's to be stuck in something against your will, it's pretty ironic. Because oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes, the very thing that we're stuck in, against our will, we were led to by our own decision making, by our own will. Do you see the irony of that? And yet what he's saying is, hey, uh, if you would just keep your eyes on Jesus, you would avoid this difficulty. And yet we know that this is true. Like any regret we have in life, any guilt that we feel, this is the cause. Like this is the result of following what? Our feelings. So we feel hurt. And what do we do? We snap at someone we love. Like we, we feel jealous and so we tear other people down or we feel insecure and so we beat ourselves up or we feel lustful and so we look at things that we know we shouldn't look at or we feel embarrassed so we go and we delete our browser history so no one would ever find that. Like we follow our feelings and ultimately what happens is we get ourselves into trouble. And I could go on, I could list more, but you don't need me to because the idea here is simply this, that, that Paul is exposing a lie and he's going to do it with every single one of these metaphors. But the lie is this, that, that, hey, according to the world, you should always trust your feelings. You should always trust your feelings. And yet we know that that's not true. That's a lie. Because when we trust our feelings, we get ourselves into what? Trouble. We find ourselves in places we never thought we would be. Now, let me just be very clear. I am not saying that feelings are bad. Like, listen, God made feelings. Like, you didn't give yourself those things. God gave you those specifically so that you could enjoy relationship with them. That's why we feel the way we do. It's so that we could feel as we navigate through life. Man, how, how would God walk through these things with me? You have feelings on purpose. But listen, you shouldn't make decisions based on your feelings alone. That's bad news. Why? Well, here's the truth to counter the lie. When you're in your feelings, you are out of focus. Like when you're in your feelings, you are so out of focus. And when you're out of focus, you can't do hard things. You can't make hard decisions. You can't have hard conversations. That's the difference between soldiers and citizens in this passage. Like one of those, they do hard things, and the others, they don't do hard things. That's the difference. One is driven by focus, the other is driven by feelings. One runs to the fight, the other runs from the fight. One exists for battle, the other does not exist for battle. One, one he rises in the face of adversity, and the other falls. I love what Charles Spurgeon, he says about this. He says, a truly good soldier of Jesus Christ knows nothing about difficulties except as things to be surmounted. If his master bids him perform exploits too hard for him, he draws upon the resources of omnipotence and he achieves impossibilities. He achieves impossibilities. What's, what's Spurgeon saying here? He's saying, hey, the Christian life, it's anything but easy. It's anything but easy. Like at the point of salvation, your worst days are behind you, 100%. Point of salvation, worst days are behind you. Yet hard days will still be in your future. Like you still will face difficulties. And yet what we learn from Spurgeon here, what he's saying is, hey, God, he is the one that will enable you to do the difficult things you face in life. He's the one that supplies you with the strength you need to rise to the occasion, ultimately to overcome whatever obstacle you face. That difficulty is really just an opportunity. That's all it is. That when you know the Lord and you're indwelt by his spirit and you're empowered for his service to live the life, to live your life the way he would want, what ends up happening is 
is every difficulty, it's just, an op- it's just an opportunity to ultimately overcome. That's all it is. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, the second thing that Paul tells us about doing hard things is we must pay the price to win the prize. We gotta pay the price to win the prize. Verse five, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Like the second metaphor Paul uses to teach us about how to do hard things is an athlete. Like why would he choose to teach us about athletes? Why is that a metaphor that he's pulling on? Because the essence of athletics, it's really just characterized by this one thing, effort. Like that's the essence of Athletics. Now, I'm not belittling the fact that talent is important. Talent is extremely important in athletics. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to winning and losing, what, like, what separates the great from the good? It's effort, especially at the highest level. It's the person that's willing to go the farthest to get the most. So there's a new movie uh, on Netflix. It's called Hustle. Anybody seen it in here? Hustle? Uh, it's an Adam Sandler, uh, Adam Sandler film. If you like Adam Sandler, I'd recommend it. I thought it was pretty good personally. Uh, that the whole story of this movie is it's about a basketball scout, uh, Adam. And what he's doing is he's trying to find the next great player. Like he, he scouts for the 76ers, and so he's looking for a great new addition to their team. And what he ends up deciding is, okay, uh, I can't find anybody in the States. I've been traveling the country, and so I'm going to start looking kind of off the beaten map. And what he ends up finding is a guy in Spain. And yet what's interesting about this guy Boa, is you learn that, man, this guy, he's not your normal basketball player. Like, he has no organized basketball experience. No, instead, he's a construction worker, and yet he is ridiculously talented. Like, he has all of the chops to ultimately make it in the league. And so what does he do? Sandler, he springs into action. Cue the Rocky training montage. Like, he grabs this guy and he pulls him in, and they start doing everything they can to get him ready. Start applying all of the effort to harness his potential, his talent, so that he can make it in the league. They start running down the street. They start lifting weights. They start putting up shots. They start running drills. And what you see is that ultimately, the difference between where this guy is and where he needs to be, the difference, the gap, it's closed by effort. That's what we find. It's closed by discipline. You see, a tremendous price must be paid in effort to win if you're an athlete. And the same is true for Christians. The same is true if you follow Jesus. Like, in order to do hard things in life, we must, must be disciplined. It's required. It's necessary. Because discipline, it's ultimately what allows you to persist in order to attain the goal of the upward call in Christ. So it begs the question, what's discipline? How do we define discipline? Well, I think that our 16th president, President Lincoln, he says it really well. He says this, discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. Discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. To say it differently, discipline, it's what lies between the temptations you face and the decisions you make. Like, that's what's in the center between the temptations you face in life and the decisions you make in life. It's discipline. That's ultimately what closes the divide. Jesus, he would describe discipline like this in Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he'll find it. You see, according to Jesus, a disciplined life, it consists of two things. It consists of two things, self-discipline and self-denial. Self-discipline, self-decision, excuse me. It's the ability to choose what's good. That's what it is. And Jesus says it right here. He says, hey, if anyone would come after me, so you need to make the self-decision, deciding for yourself that, man, Jesus, you're worthy of pursuing It's the ability to choose what's good. Self-denial is the ability to reject what's bad. It's looking across life and saying, man, okay, I can do that. I can make the decision to go where it's best. And then at the same time, I can deny the things that I want to go to that are actually worst for me. You see, discipline is the capacity to slay the things that harm your competitive edge and defend the things that ultimately help you be most disciplined in life that ultimately help you to have as much in common with Jesus as possible. So last night, 
um, I was prepping this message, and I learned this lesson myself. So recently, uh, I was gone last week. My wife, she made this batch of cookies, uh, and these cookies, they are, and I got to get all of it together, they're peanut butter, chocolate chip, oatmeal cookies, three of my favorite ingredients in any dessert. And to top it off, she put salt on top, which is just like that perfect taste of savory and sweet. And so they are everything you would want in a dessert. Like they are delectable. Like they're, they're chewy, they're buttery, they're salty, they're sweet. Like they are all things to all people at one time. The epitome of perfect dessert. And so I closed my laptop last night and I hear something in the kitchen. And so I decide like, okay, naturally, I'm gonna go check out and see what it is. And so I make my way into the kitchen and you know what I heard? Those cookies whispering my name. <laughs> I was frozen in a moment of decision. Like, it's late. I need to go to bed. I'm not getting any younger. These calories aren't going to burn themselves, but they look so good. And so, uh, though it was hard, I made the choice. I didn't have one. I had two. Uh, and uh, I delightfully ate them, and I went uh, to bed. I was undisciplined. And while the consequence of that decision, it was small. Listen, there have been some times in my life where I have been extremely undisciplined and the cost has been really great. Like that's the cost of not having discipline in your life. The ability to do what's best, it costs you. So how does a lack of discipline cost you? Like where in your life where you know, man, I should, have, I should have done what I knew to do. I should have been disciplined. I should have made the right decision. I should have made the right call, gone towards what's best, and then de denied myself, moved away from what's worse. When has that cost you in your life? Listen, I ask you this for this reason. God, he has given every single person very specific gifts that have such amazing potential to impact the world in such a way that we fail to realize it. Like genuinely, gifts that, man, they are potent if we would actually unleash them for all that they are worth, and yet we fail to realize their potential. You see, the difference between the impact you can make and the impact you will make in life, it's discipline. Like, that's what stands between where you are and what you ultimately, what ultimately could be true of you. And here's the second lie we pick up in this metaphor. Like, again, one lie to every metaphor. This is the lie. Uh, the world is telling us, hey, you just do what makes you happy. You just do what makes you happy. Ah, that discipline, forget that. Like, you don't need to be disciplined. Just do what makes you happy. And yet, here's the danger of that philosophy. Because if you do what makes you happy, it won't necessarily help you to get any better. Does that make sense? Like sometimes in life you're going to do things that, man, they make me feel great, but they're not going to promote your maturity or your improvement or you becoming more like Jesus. So here's the truth in the face of that lie. Do what makes you holy. Like don't do what makes you happy. Do what makes you holy in life. Exercise discipline. Do what's difficult. Face adversity. Grow up into all that God wants you to be. Harness your gifts for all the potential they have and ultimately become mature. Like, be like Jesus. Matthew 7, 13, it says this. I was studying this with a group of guys two weeks ago, and, and it came alive to me in a way I've never before seen because of their insight. It says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it, they are many. Listen, the path of least resistance, that's it. It is always easier to take. And yet verse 14 says, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. If you want to seek after life, and this is talking about eternal life, but it's not just talking about your life in eternity. It is also talking about the fullness of life right now. If you want that, it's not found by simply doing what's easiest, by doing what makes you happy. No, what it, it's found by doing what you know you must do, by being disciplined in life. You walk the way that is hard because you know the way that's hard, though it may be difficult, it's worth it. That's why you do it. The final lesson we learned from Paul about doing hard things in life is this, that we work hard and we trust the process. We work hard and trust the process. 
It says this in verse 6. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. So here's Paul's third and final metaphor. He goes to what? To farming, naturally. Uh, it kind of it descends. It goes from soldiers, noble, to athletes, really cool, to farmers. It just kind of moves down, and yet he's strategic in the way that he's bringing out, uh, bringing out farmers because he wants to illustrate to us this, that, hey, uh, ultimately the essence of a, of a farmer is what? Hard work. Hard work. Like, think about farmers. Like, they slave. They give their lives away to ultimately tilling the soil and, and like, sowing the seed and raising crops, and no one's watching. They do it with no expectation of recognition at all. And they not only have the persistence to prepare the soil, but they also have the patience to what? To wait to see if, man, is all of my work, is it going to be in vain or will I actually yield good fruit? Like, will the rain fall? Will the harvest be plentiful? Like, they have an infinite, like, this is crazy to me. Farmers, they have an infinitely countercultural perspective to the rest of the world. Like, it's so different. Like, they labor tirelessly and they have no expectation of ever being recognized for it. Who wants to sign up for that job? Like, hey, go to work and no one will ever see you or care. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is they, they have no control of the outcome. Like, they can control the input. They can put all of their effort into sowing great seed and taking care of the soil and raising up these crops. And yet they have no control, ultimately, of what the outcome will look like. Like, they can't see it. Like, they are signing up for a life where they work hard but are never recognized and have no control. And yet Paul, he's like, that, that's you. You wanna do hard things, you be like a farmer. You see, he wants Timothy to learn this, the value of perseverance, to keep going, to have grit, to not give up, to lean in when it's difficult. So see, growing up, uh, my favorite sport was basketball. I just gravitated towards it naturally. It was just a thing that I liked to play, but I wasn't really any good at it. Uh, I didn't really try very hard, like I, to be clear. Like I didn't really give much effort towards it. I really loved the sport. I uh, loved playing church league, but I just never really committed myself to it. And yet, it was great for me. All the way from first to seventh grade, there were no tryouts. Like, hey, you just show up, they put you on the team, you get to play, it was awesome. And yet, when eighth grade rolled around, I knew like, okay, listen, it's about to get real. They've got tryouts coming, which means I've actually got to put some effort into this thing. Like, if I actually want to make the team and play the sport, I have to put in a little bit of work. And so uh, I decided, you know what, there are guys around me. And listen, I wasn't terrible, but they are much better players. I don't know that I'd ever dribbled with a left hand at that point in my life. And so I was like, okay, listen, there are better players around me. How can I get, like, a, an advantage? What can I do to ultimately get myself in the best possible position to make the team? Well, there's a good chance these tryouts are like last year's tryouts. So uh, I asked a buddy that was a year older than me that was on the team. Hey, what'd you guys do? Like, what were, the, what were the rules of the trial? What did you guys do? How did they audition you to prepare for the team? And he's like, hey, well, there were three drills. Number one, this drill called the Mikan drill. It just means you stand under the basket and, uh, and you just, you can prove that you can put it in with a left and a right hand. So you just go back and forth. The second drill were left and right-handed layups. So now you needed to demonstrate not only could you put the ball up with the left or right hand, but you need to be able to dribble with it and then move towards a transitionary shot. And then the last one is shooting from the elbow, which is just by the free throw line. Very simple. These were the three drills. And so listen, I didn't know what was coming, but I knew, hey, if I master these, then I've got a shot. And so I committed myself. I put all of myself into learning these three drills. And I'll be honest, man, like I got them down. I showed up the day of, and it was the three drills, and I crushed it. Like I was everything that I would have expected from all the effort I put in in two weeks' notice. You see, I was dialed, and to my surprise, I made the A-team. Thank you. (laughs) I made it. I got on. They slotted me for the A-team. To my surprise, like, gosh, I can't believe this happened. And then I show up for my first week of practice. And what I learned as I started to practice with the A-team is that though my tryout was similar my performance was distinctly different than all the guys around me. And it was not only apparent to me that I wasn't as good, it was also apparent to my coaches. And so I got demoted. I got moved from A team to B team and then to C team. I got slotted all the way down and I was riding the pine on C team. Uh, Why do I share that with you? Because uh, 
I worked hard in the short term. And listen, I got some good out of it. But these guys, like they had persevered for the long haul. They had given themselves for years investing in their craft so that when the moment came, they were ready. They worked hard. They were persevering in nature. We should aspire to be the same. We should aspire to work hard. And yet here's the thing, Metro. Can we just be really honest with ourselves? Like a lot of us are afraid of hard work. A lot of us are afraid of hard work. And you know, it's not that there isn't reason for it. Like maybe it's your job. Like you have a boss who he actually or she actually holds you accountable. And so instead of addressing the stress in your life and showing up and giving your best effort, instead, it just, it's easier to get out. It's just easier to slip out the door. Like maybe it's not your job. Maybe it's your relationship. You need to set up some parameters in your life so that you can ultimately benefit the flourishing of you and your girlfriend, boyfriend. And yet, man, that's just a hard conversation to have. And then we have to actually agree to sticking by those things. And then if we don't agree, if we don't actually stick to the parameters we've set, now there's a whole lot of room for guilt and we feel ashamed of what we've done. And, and so you just, instead of having the hard conversation, putting in the effort, what do you do? You just, you just bypass it. Maybe it's not a relationship. Maybe it's your singleness. Like you've been waiting. You've been praying. You've been putting yourself out there. You've been working on your character and yet, you're starting to lose hope. Like early 20s to late 20s to early 30s to late 30s, and it just feels like that light at the end of the tunnel that you thought you were driving towards, it feels like you're moving in reverse and it's getting dimmer and dimmer. Maybe it's not your singleness, maybe it's your sin. Like a habit you have, an addiction you're carrying, it feels too hard to confess to people. Like what will they think of me? Like, can I actually put myself out there and trust that they'll actually accept me, forgive me, walk with me? No, that, that feels like this, it's too hard to overcome. And so I'm just going to give in. I'm just going to keep going back and giving into that sin. Listen, I, I don't know what feels hard in your life. And I want to be really clear. I am not trying to make light of the difficulties we face. Some of you, you have an unbelievably difficult circumstance. But I do want to challenge you. Like in love, as someone that is a peer to you, I want to challenge you. Don't give up. Like lean in, persevere, keep moving, have some grit. Like at the end of the day, do what is at hand. Do what's revealed to you. Whatever you know you're supposed to, do it. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, whatever you do, work heartily, work hard. Whatever you do. So are you a, an employee? Like, work hard at being a good employee. Are you a brother? Work hard at being a good brother. Are you a boyfriend? Work hard at being a good boyfriend. Are you a roommate? Work hard at being a good roommate. Whatever it is, whatever you do, work hard, heartily. Ask for the Lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward. And then it ends with this. You work hard because you are serving the Lord Christ. So last story, just as we come to a close. I, when I was at Breakaway, my former job, I was working, uh, I was working, I was going to school simultaneously, and, and one of my seminary professors at the time, he actually, he would partner with Breakaway uh, and different ministry initiatives we had. And so I remember, we were trying to line him up to come in and do some teaching for us. And so I gave him a phone call, uh, and I was like, hey, man, like, what's going on? Uh, he's like, hey, yeah, uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm walking out of the classroom. I just packed up my stuff. Uh, great, dude, like, you going home for the day? Or, no, nah, man, no, nah, I'm going to, I'm actually, I've got to go to Discount Tire. Discount Tire, like, dude, did you, flat? Like, what happened? Uh, no, man, no, 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 uh, it's my second job. Oren, you why are you working at Discount Tire? Like, that, that's certainly not needed. And he was like, no, man, no, it's not needed, but it's just a great opportunity for me to reach out to people. Warren, that job sounds miserable. Yeah, you know, but it doesn't have to be fulfilling to be worthwhile. <laughs> Talk about convicting. Like, this guy took a job at Discount Tire to rotate people's tires and do free air checks just so he could reach out to the guys that were slaving it with them. 
pushing rubber. You see, Oren knew what it meant to work hard. His value, his, the reward of his work, it wasn't in the, in the paycheck he received, or the benefits he could get, or the recognition he might earn. Now, his reward was in the work itself. Like his reward were, it was in the conversations he'd have with the guys just in the by and by. Like his reward, it was just in waiting on the Lord to honor his faithfulness and present an opportunity to share the gospel. Oren's reward, it was, it was simply knowing like, man, even as I'm doing something that isn't gratifying, God's, he's making me better. He's making me more like Jesus. You see, Oren's mentality, this mentality, it flies in the face of the world. Like the world, they are wanting to, pro- they, they are propagating the lie that it's only right if it's fulfilling. Like, hey, the things you pursue in life, you only pursue them if they're fulfilling. And I'm not here to say, like, man, don't go and be fulfilled. No, I think it's great. It's worthy of seeking after to find fulfillment in your life, in your job even. But I think it begs the question, what is our definition of fulfilling? Like, how are we defining fulfillment? Like, there's a difference in something being fulfilling and something giving you full of feeling. Y'all get that, right? Like, there's a difference in having something that's genuinely fulfilling. Like, man, there's purpose in what I'm doing, God, and being someplace that fills you with filling so that it feels enjoyable, gratifying. I'm making a difference. If something is only as fulfilling as the feeling it gives you, let me be a friend and say you might need to check your motivation for doing what you're doing. The lie that the world is propagating is, hey, you just do what's fulfilling. And yet here's the truth we know, that we, Christians, we are meant to find meaning in the mundane. We find meaning in the mundane. Just because your work, just because your activity, it isn't sexy, doesn't mean it isn't worthwhile. In fact, God, it's amazing. He works in the waiting. Like in those moments where it's like, man, God, are you even doing anything? Nothing's happening. That's when God's working. Like when you've given everything you can, you put all the work in, and you decide, like, man, there's nothing else for me to do, and you clock out, that's when God clocks in. He goes to work. And yet before he works on your problem, he works on you. Like he starts to mold in you, craft in you the things that he knows you need, not just for the job ahead or not just for the relationship ahead or not just for the the city you'll be moving to? No, he starts to work in the things you need to become as much like his son as possible. That's what God's doing. He is working in the waiting. The scriptures say this, that, that one day to the Lord is like 10,000 years. Like he's got nothing but time. He is totally available for you. The question is, will we available for him? That as he's working hard, will we wait and believe, God, you're worthy of waiting on. I can trust you. You've not given up, and so I will not give up on you. And that's what he wants. He wants us to wait when things get hard. Because when we wait, we trust. That's what ends up happening. And the reason we know this is because this is how God, he redeemed the world. He had us wait. He had us trust that he would send someone to do the hardest thing imaginable live a perfect life, die a perfect death, covering a multitude of sin so that he could rise on the third day and bring us home with him. You see, Jesus, he focused on what mattered in life, and he did not get distracted by everything else going on. He was focused. He lived the way God needed him to live, the way that you and I could not. And not only that, Jesus, he paid the price to ultimately win the prize of being with me and you. And listen, the reward is not in having you. The reward is in accomplishing his work, his plan to redeem all things and bring us back to himself. And yet he loved you enough to come and get you. He paid the price. He was willing to do it. And here's what's amazing, that as he rose from the grave, we now, you know what we do? We work hard in the waiting. Like we expect that he'll come back, that he will come and bring us home to be with him. Like, he's at work in the waiting. This is why we do hard things in life. Listen, Metro, if you want to do hard things in life, if you're wondering how do I go about it, you need to look no further than Jesus Christ. He is the one who did the hardest thing in life. And so if you want to move through life 
with the kind of focus and discipline and trust that we've seen here, look to his life, and he'll show you the way. Let me pray for us. Well, Jesus, we're grateful for this time. We're grateful, God, to have had these few moments just to read your word and to feel it apply. Like, I pray, God, that we would feel it apply to our life. God, we're not meant to study the text just so we can learn, God, whatever it is, whatever it is the Bible is trying to explain. No, God, we're meant to learn it so that we could understand and ultimately, God, put it into practice. God, that's what we're trying to do here. And so I pray, Lord, like, would you help us to be sensitive to your Spirit's leading in these moments? to be receptive to what you're trying to impart, to be responsive as we move back into a time of worship. You know, the way this passage ends, Metro, is in verse 7, it says, Think over what I say. Think over what I say. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Like, that's the... That's the natural step after we walk through something like this. As we assess how to do hard things in life, we think, we contemplate, we introspect, we try and understand, God, what is true in my life as it pertains to these truths? And God, now what should be true? How can I change? What are you revealing? How can I move and be different because of this? And so if you're a believer in here, that's the response. It's to think in these next few moments over these ideas, do they apply? And then to respond accordingly. If you're not a believer, if you don't know Jesus, are hard things ahead of you? Yes, but you need to realize there is still something so hard behind you, and it is your sin. Would you come to Jesus? Would you tell him, Lord, be the Lord of my life. Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins? I recognize that you did the hardest thing. And now I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior, forgiver of my sins, and the promise of a new life as I walk with you. You can just tell him, I place my faith in you. Would you lead me anew? But God, we trust you in these next few moments. We pray that God make us like your son Lead us to do hard things in light of the one who did the hardest of things for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.